Yeah, now we're recording. <laughs> awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another live community classroom with Michaels. It's finally December, and we have our friend Edie Ekman with us today for a lovely holiday project. She's going to be teaching us how to stitch up this jolly Santa hat. My name is Renee L. from Yarn Inspirations, and I'll be helping with any questions you might have during today's class. So please feel free to drop your questions in the chat, and we'll make sure that Edie answers them. While we're getting ready to kick things off, let us know where you're watching from and where you plan to wear the Santa hat or who you're giving it to. All right, over to you, Edie. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm really excited about doing this Santa hat, not only because, as Renee said, it's finally December, but this is actually a hat I designed many years ago, but I don't have a Santa hat. So I have already made myself a Santa hat, um, and then um, I'm going to be making a few more because there's plenty of yarn um, in these in the yarn cake that I'm going to show you. So the yarn that I'm using today is Karen's Crystal Cakes. So this is a big, I don't know how it has a lot of yardage in it. I can't, 600 and something yards. So you can make several Santa hats with this. I'm using colors Claret and Shea Butter, which are kind of a pretty gray and wine colored. So it's not your traditional red and white Santa hat. It's kind of a more sophisticated Santa hat. And it's got a little bit of sparkle and a little bit of fuzz in it. So if you like that, you can use this Karen Crystal Cakes, or you can just use any um, worsted weight yarn that, that you like. You may even have something in your stash. The pattern originally called for Red Heart Holiday, which I think has been discontinued, but it just was a, a plain yarn with a little bit of sparkle in it. So sparkle, no sparkle, you know, you may have people who are more glitter conscious in your family and, you know, whatever, whatever you like. There's so many yarns that will, work, that will work with this. I'm using a size H, five millimeter hook. That's what gave me gauge. Now, some of you have heard me talk about gauge before. Gauge matters even for hats, okay? You want your hat to fit around your head you don't want it to come down here and you don't want it to sit right, right up here. So this pattern is written for two different sizes, but you do want to do a gauge swatch to make sure that you are getting the gauge what, that's called for. And I'm looking, it's 12 double crochets equals four inches. So you're gonna do a little gauge swatch to make sure that you're getting 12 double crochets and eight rounds over four inches. If you aren't, then change your hook size and do another gauge swatch because you want your hat to fit, okay? So gauge matters even with a hat, whether or not you believe me, okay? <laughs> so let's switch to my hands and talk about the crocheting. Uh, give me just a sec here. And if you hear a um, kind of weird hum in the background, there's a guy with a mower and leaf blower right outside my window because of course, they always show up on Thursdays at one o'clock, right, when I'm doing this. So um, just we'll just ignore that and um, I'll try to ignore it too. So here's the hat and let me talk you through how it's constructed and then I'll show you this step-by-step. Step. What you do to start with is you start with the the gray color or color, what do they call it, color A. And you're working back and forth in rows this way. And I'll show you that in a minute. So you're working just a long strip in back loop only single crochet. Then you join it to form a tube. So then you have this, um, this circle of hat band and then you're gonna pick up stitches around the edge of that tube. So now you're gonna start working in the round going around like this. Then you'll change color to the red or the wine color, work straight for a while and then start decreasing every few rows. So I'll show you those decreases too. The thing that makes the hat this kind of pointy shape instead of a more rounded shape is because the decreases are spaced out more. So a lot of times in a hat that has a round top you're going to decrease every round at some point once you get to the crown. But on this one, we're working like a decrease round, then a straight round, then a decrease round, and a straight round. And that's what gets it pointy to the top. And if you wanted it to be even longer, you just add more straight rounds. And if you wanted one of those really long, you know, like remember, I don't know, and does anybody remember the 70s? I remember I had a hat that had it was, it was shaped like this, but it was so long that it became a scarf. 
I don't know if they still make those or not. That's how old I am. Okay, so let's see what this looks like when we are working the band. I have started here. Um, I just started a little band. This is because I'm going to make another hat. It says to chain 11 stitches and then work single crochet across. So you end up with 10 stitches in your band. But to get this ridged shape or this single crochet ribbing, can you see that that's kind of a ridge and it's ridged on both sides? What you do is you work into the back loop only. So I'm going to turn and chain one. Whoops, I think I've already chained. Nope, I haven't. And then I'm going to work into the back loop only of each stitch. So normally you work under two loops of a stitch. So you'd work under the V like this, but the back loop only is the one that's furthest away from me. So it doesn't have anything to do with right side and wrong side. It's just what is furthest away from me. So I will do single crochet in each stitch across like this in the back loop only. And if you watch when I work into the back loop only, I'm leaving that front loop out here unworked and that's what creates that bump or that ridge. So work all the way across. I wanna make absolutely sure that I'm maintaining the same number of stitches because it's not gonna look right if you increase and decrease along the band. So you wanna make sure that you are maintaining 10 stitches all the way across. So you just do that a bunch of times, back and forth, back and forth. I'm gonna to switch to my other little band here cause I'm gonna make a tiny hat. So here I've been doing back and forth, back and forth on fewer stitches, as you can see. Now the pattern says to work until the piece measures 18 or 20 inches, depending on which size you wanna make. So I, I am making the small slash medium size because let me talk a minute about hats. So uh, Ash, could you switch back to my face for a minute, please? Um, when you make a hat, you wanna make sure that you have negative ease in your hat. So if you measure your head and if your head measures 22 inches, you don't want a hat that measures 22 inches because that's going to be too big. You want a hat that's going to stretch a little bit over your head. So let me put on a hat and it's gonna mess up my hair and we don't care, right? So this hat, I'll, I'll measure it in a minute. I don't remember what it measures. So can you see that it's stretching a little bit when I pull it on? Because if it was exactly the same size as my head, then it would be down here like this, right? So I want to make sure that I have negative ease. So if my head's 22 inches around, so much for the hair. Um, if my head's 22 inches around, I probably want a 20 inch hat so it can stretch just a little bit. Okay, thanks, we can go back to my hands now. So when you have finished your uh, band, let me do another couple of rows here. These are really short ones. The pattern says to cut the yarn and then sew the front, the, the two ends together. But I wanna show you what I think is an even better way to do it. And yes, I know I wrote this pattern, but sometimes patterns are written um, so that people won't ask questions about them so that the more people will understand. So here's what I would typically do when um, creating this band. Rather than cut my yarn and sew the ends together because that's kind of a pain in the butt. Whoops, did I say that out loud? No. Nope. All right. I am going to bring my two ends together. So the two short ends, I'm going to pull together like this, chain one. And now I am going to single crochet together, but through the back loop. So I'm gonna go under the back loop here, and then I'm gonna go maybe under both here. I, this is kind of fuzzy yarn, I can't quite see, but maybe under both loops on the other side. But I'm just gonna go through the back loop 
it kind of depends on what you did at the beginning of the round as to how many loops you have available here. But you want to work like this. So now I'm just single crocheting the two ends together because let me do one more here. Now that has taken care of seaming them. I had an extra little tail there. I'll get rid of that in a minute. Let's move that here. All right. So I have sort of seamed them together by single crocheting both ends together without having to sew. Now I can turn it the other way because I'm going to consider that the wrong side. And when I turn it right side out, you really can't see that seam at all. So it looks like it's unbroken through here. So you would have a hard time seeing that. You can see it a little bit more because this yarn subtly changes color. So you can kind of see that there, but it's really pretty invisible, I think. Then the other nice thing is you don't have to do what the pattern says when it says um, to start the crown, because it says with right side facing, join A with a slip stitch along one long side of brim, meaning along here. But you know what? My yarn A is already there. It's already in place. So I don't have to join it with a slip stitch because it's just there at the end of my seam that I did. So now I'm going to work evenly around. And the pattern says to work 60 or 66 stitches evenly spaced. Chances are that's going to be one single crochet in each end of the round around. And the way I do that is I find it really easy to see this ridge and this ridge when I'm working. And so I just think, okay, I need to put two stitches in between each of those vertical lines. So that's how I do this evenly spaced. I just make sure that I have two stitches between each of those vertical lines. And that is actually, if I do that, that is actually one stitch in each row end. So let me get around this little one. Obviously I am not going to have, oops, I'm gonna show you what I did here and that's a mistake. I'm not gonna have 66 stitches, obviously. Okay, what I did here was I accidentally worked too far in. You see how I worked around the post of a stitch? I wanna actually work into the stitch. So I'm gonna take that one out and make sure that I'm working into the side of the stitch, not around the stitch. If I work into around the stitch, I'm gonna get a little hole there. And I tried to do it again. With this little, this fuzzy yarn, you kind of have to feel your way sometimes more than actually seeing what you're doing. All righty. Let's see, have I gotten around yet? Not quite. Oops, I'm running out of yarn because I had to cut the yarn because I was doing this. So I didn't leave myself quite enough yarn to finish. As I say, there's plenty of yarn to make several hats. All right, so when I come around, I will be through with the gray or the white or whatever color you wanna be using here for this part of it. And I want to have basically a multiple of six stitches. I'm not sure I'm gonna have that here. The nice thing about this pattern, it really is easy because you're only doing single crochet or back loop single crochet and then double crochet and everything else is, is just plain. It's just plain double crochet stitches. Okay, so here I am. I'm going to join with a slip stitch in the first stitch and fasten off my gray. All right, so there is my little 
hat brim or cuff or whatever you want to call it. And it's time to change colors. Now, I went ahead and fastened off rather than changing colors, um, rather than changing. If I'd wanted to, I could have done my last slip stitch with the red and then done a chain three. But I want to show you another little nuance that I'm going to do that's not written into the pattern, but it's one of my favorite ways of starting a new color. Let me first show you what you might be more familiar doing. And that is, it might be that you would be familiar with just, eh, it's hard to pull out. Slip stitching to the first stitch with the new color and then doing a chain three to start the next row, next round, which is fine. That's a perfectly good way to change color. But what I prefer to do, if I know I'm gonna be starting a new color, I prefer to just finish with the old color yep, and start anew with the new color. Now, you may be familiar with doing, like you join with a slip stitch, and then you chain three to get up here to begin doing our double crochet round. That's fine, but I bet that you cannot tell me that that chain three looks anything at all like a double crochet. Nope, it doesn't. It looks like a chain three. It's pretending to be a double crochet. It's acting like a double crochet, but it doesn't look like one. I wanna show you a better way to start. I'm going to put a slip knot on my hook, just like I'm starting a new, starting a chain. There's my slip knot, leaving a nice long tail. And I'm going to do a double crochet. Yarn over, go into that first stitch, pull up a loop, yarn over, pull through two, yarn over, pull through two. I've done what's called a standing double crochet. All I did was start with a slip knot on my hook and do a double crochet. Boom, that's it. But now it looks like a double crochet. It doesn't have that chain three look to it. So I'm on row or round two of the pattern. So I'm gonna say that was my chain three, whatever. Then I'm going to double crochet in each stitch around. So, you know, I just say talk amongst yourselves so I can get around here. And then I'll show you about the decreases. So you made your hat band or brim a little bit smaller than, <clears throat> than your head size. But now when you're doing these double crochets, this is going to be the part that hugs your head, right? The, the brim is there or the band is there. That's going to hug your head. And we know it's smaller, but here's where gauge is going to come into it. Because if your gauge isn't right on this part, then the part of the hat that, that goes around your head, and you can kind of see that in the picture, is these next four, six rows, rounds, let's say rounds. And if it's too big, it's going to go falling down over your eyes. And if it's too tight, it's going to give you a headache. So. You definitely want your hat to fit. If you have a lot of hair, you may want to make the larger size. Or if you have a larger head, you may want to make the larger size. Um, I have found that it's not just, say, guys who have a bigger head necessarily, unless they happen to be big people. Um, you really have to measure each individual's head. I have a friend who has a tiny head. She has this, a head the size of a 10-year-old. You wouldn't know that. She doesn't look like she has a tiny head, but she really wears child size hats because that's what fits her. Okay, so here I am coming around here, put my last stitch in here, and then I want to join with a slip stitch to the top of that stitch. Now I use that standing double crochet. You may have used a chain three, doesn't matter whichever, you're gonna join with a slip stitch. That's the end of your first round. So you wanna stop 
at this point and count your stitches to make sure that you have the right number of stitches. So you have 60 or 66 stitches, depending on which size you're making. Let me just double check. That's what you're supposed to have, yep. So you wanna stop and make sure you have the right number of stitches. If you have trouble recognizing the beginning of a round, you might wanna put a marker in the beginning, the first stitch of the round so that you can find it again. You don't wanna get confused and think that this slip stitch is a stitch. And I'm actually gonna reach over here. I don't have my markers handy. Hang on just a sec. They were right off camera, but I'm just gonna stick a marker in here so we'll be able to find it later. So that slip stitch right there is not a stitch. So I don't wanna put it there, but what I'm going to do now is I am going to need to chain three, one, two, three, and I'm going to put a marker right there in that third chain. That's the chain right below the crochet hook. The loop that's on my hook is not a stitch. It's the stitch right below it that's a stitch. Now, because this chain three counts as a double crochet, because my pattern tells me that it counts as a double crochet, because of that, I'm not going to put a stitch right here where that uh, chain starts because that would be increasing. I'm going to skip that spot and work into the next one. And that's because that chain three counts as a stitch. And then I'm just going to work in each stitch around. This is the part where you really can watch TV or whatever. So I'm going to work around and then I'm going to show you a decrease round the next time. And Renee, while I'm doing this, will you let me know if there are any questions in the chat? Yeah, we have a few that I can go through. Mm -hmm. We have a few. Um, so have you ever had that experience where sometimes the yarn will have like the, the yarn that you receive will have a breakage in it or a knot for whatever reason something happened within production. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations for how to resolve that, um, like how to join if it's something that needs to be continuous? Sure. So let me just pretend we have a knot right here. Always. I always cut it out. So let's say. Let's say this yarn had a knot or an uneven place. You know, sometimes something just caught or there's a weak spot or something. So let's say there's a spot there. I'm going to cut both sides of it and throw that away. And then I'm just gonna treat this like it's, you know, I'm joining a new yarn. So I'll just hold these two ends together, start my new stitch. And then I'm going, notice that I'm leaving at least a four inch tail here for worsted weight yarn, because I wanna have plenty available to weave in later. If you are in the habit of leaving tiny little tails like this, whoops, if this is you, and I'm looking at you, cause I know some of you are doing this, you're leaving tails like this, right? I know some of you are doing that, that is not long enough. Leave at least a four inch tail. You aren't saving yourself any money by just scrimping on you know, two inches here and there, but what it enables you to do then is to go back later and weave in those ends nice and securely and they won't come undone. You don't need to tie a knot as long as you're weaving in your yarn tails. So that's my response to how to get rid of knots or uneven places or, or places where the spinning looks like it didn't quite work. That always happens with, with every yarn at some point. Okay. Perfect. Um, I'm going to go to one that was from a few minutes ago. So this would have been from a few rows ago. Mm -hmm. um, Tracy asked, then you crochet the ends together. Do you have to make sure both ends are similar since every other row bubbles out and the other rows bubble in. 
Um, if you're being particular, you probably do. And I can't tell you right off the top of my head um, which, which way it is. Sometimes I'll do that. I don't have another one to show you right now. Sometimes I'll do it. And then when I turn it, you know, turn it the other way, I go, oops, that doesn't look as good as I'd like it to. And so I'll take it out and I'll do one more row. And then I know that'll be right. So that's a really good question. I didn't make that point, but I just do it because it's not that many stitches and, and then turn it inside out or right side out and decide if I like it. And if I like it, I'm good to go. If not, I take it out and then either take out a row or add a row, um, you know, and do it again. So great question. Perfect. I'm just going to bug you with one more technical one before we move on. Um, does the standing DC count as a stitch? Yes. Yes. It is an absolute honest to goodness stitch rather than a chain three, which is a train, which is a chain masquerading as a stitch. The standing <laughs> double crochet is an actual honest to goodness stitch. So yes, it counts as a stitch. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So here I am back at the beginning of my round. And remember when I left that marker in, that's now showing me that's where the top of that chain is. And that's where I'm going to join with a slip stitch. So I'm going to put my hook under here. And I know that the red may be a little bit hard to see, but I'm going to join with a slip stitch right here. Put lotion on my hands before I started class today and now they're too slick to manipulate things. All right, so here's my slip stitch. And the pattern tells me to do that round two for rounds three, four, five, and six. In other words, round two is nothing but double crochet in each stitch around, right? So it's just a plain work even. Let's pretend that I had done rounds three through six, which are just plain rounds. In other words, we're working straight up. See, this is round one, two, three, four, five, six. You see how that's all the same? And then row seven gets a little bit smaller. So that's what I'll demonstrate now. So round seven is going to be chain three and that counts as a stitch. So I'm gonna put my marker right in here just so we can find it again. Then double crochet two together. So I'm not going to work into this first stitch because that chain three is my stitch. For double crochet two together, I'm going to make two partial double crochets and then finish them off together. So that is yarn over, go into the next stitch, yarn over, pull up a loop, yarn over, pull through two. I finished, I have not finished my double crochet. I'm gonna stop right there. You see how I have one more step left to do? I'm gonna stop right there and I'm gonna do another partial double crochet. So yarn over, go into the next stitch, yarn over, pull up a loop, yarn over, pull through two. So now I have two half finished stitches. Then I'm gonna yarn over and finish them off together. So what I have done here is I have two stitches, one here, one here, but at the top, they're just one stitch. So that's the decrease. So that's double crochet two together. Then it tells me to double crochet in next eight or nine double crochets five times. Well, I can't do that. I don't have as many stitches here. So you're gonna say double crochet in next eight stitches and I'm just gonna do it in however many here and do another double crochet two together. So the part that you're repeating is DC two tog. There's one half a stitch. There's another half a stitch, finish them off together. And then double crochet in the next eight or nine stitches. You do that whole section five times and then you do another decrease and basically double crochet in each stitch to the end. So let me do another decrease. 
there's a partial double crochet, there's another partial double crochet, and then I finish them off together. And then it's just double crochet in each stitch to end at that point. The stitch counts hopefully come out the way they're supposed to. You wanna stop when you've done that round and make sure that you have 54 or 60 stitches. I'll do another decrease here. And then the next round is just a work even round. So round eight says repeat round two. Another way to say that would be to work even, meaning that you just have the same number of stitches in that round. So let me get to the end of this round and we'll see how that shaping has started to happen. Get here at the end of the round, you're going to join with a slip stitch in that top chain. And this part gets to be, eventually it gets to be pretty easy because at least every other round you're working even. So you can see here that it's starting to, to go in just a little bit. So those decreases are gonna start to draw it in. Um, when you're doing round, let me see, round nine, I wanna talk a little bit about what's going on with it because it looks more complicated than it actually is. If you look at round seven, you have the decrease and then you're working even eight or nine stitches. So you have, let's say eight stitches between your decreases here on round seven. On round nine, which is the next decrease round, you're working even for four or five stitches, then you're decreasing then you're working three more double crochets. So when you add these numbers up, you just circle these. When you add the four or five and the three, you actually end up having seven or eight stitches between your decreases. And the reason I did it this way, instead of just having it, having the decrease start every round, is because I wanted it to be a more smooth, um, a, a more smooth decrease. If I had stacked them, so the decreases are on top of each other every time. In other words, the round starts with a decrease, and then there's another decrease. It would not be a nice smooth um, thing like this. It would you would start getting corners. Okay, so you would get six corners of decreases rather than sort of an overall decrease. So just don't be confused by that wording, which looks a little more complex than it might need to look. But what I do is I just say, okay, there's the decrease and there's seven stitches between the decreases. And here on the next one, there's six or seven. Then round 13 does the same thing you work in three and then you DC in next two. So here there are five or six plain double crochets between your decreases. When I was working, when I was doing this hat last night, I had to look at that a couple of times and think, oh, I need to tell myself, I need to understand what's going on with the pattern because trying to read the pattern five times for that, complex thing, it's, it's really not that complex as long as you understand what's happening. So my goal always, and many of you have heard me say this before, my goal is to read the pattern, maybe do a repeat of it, and then understand what it is I'm doing with my hands so I don't have to keep looking at the pattern, especially since last night I was doing it while I was watching a show where I had to read the subtitles, right? So you can't do both. You can't read the pattern and read the subtitles on the TV at the same time. Therefore, you need to figure out what's going on so you can read your crochet, because if you can read your crochet, then you don't have to be a slave to the pattern. Does that make sense? All right, before I move on to the next thing, I'm gonna ask Renee if there are any questions in the chat that I need to respond to. Yes, um, <clears throat> so Margie asked, would it be a smoother decrease? Just regarding what we were just talking about. Yes, so, so if I'm stacking the decreases, 
I start getting, I mean, that's what you would do if you wanted like a hexagonal shape because there's six decreases, but I wanted them offset from each other. So it's more of a rounded, uh, subtle decrease. Right. Perfect. Um, and I'm just gonna pop back to one from a few minutes ago. Margie had also asked, um, if we're measuring the head, what would be a good rule of thumb to follow, making the brim two inches smaller than the measurement? Yes, two inches is a pretty good negative ease. Perfect. Oh, and Patty said tapered question mark. <laughs> yes, so, so this is the, the thing that makes this tapered is not only that it's the subtle, you know, um, offset of the decreases, but also because there's that work even round in between them. So if I didn't have a work even round in between the decrease rounds, it would go more like this. Okay. Instead, it goes like that because you have that work even um, round in between. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. So as you work the decreases, obviously it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And when you get to the top, the last few rounds really get pretty small with pages here. And here's what the top of my hat looks like. So this is when I got to the last round and I had seven stitches and I still have this little hole right here, but that's okay because I'm going to take a tapestry needle, which also happens to be off camera. Why did I not have it handy? I'm gonna leave a nice long tail, thread my tapestry needle, and then I'm just going to weave in, I can go in and out like this if I want to, or I can go round and round like this if I want to. I tend to go just in and out under those strands, under those Vs. So I'm going under each stitch. And then I just give a gentle tug and it's going to pull up and tighten that hole. Then I'll take my, I may want to do that again. Sometimes I like to go through it and maybe back and forth a couple of times like this. That'll work fine. It, it won't show, and especially if I'm putting a pom-pom on it. So I'm gonna stick this in here and then I'm gonna weave it in. I talked about weaving in ends, so I'm going to show you weaving in ends, show you how I weave in ends. So here I'm not fighting with my yarn because I have plenty of yarn tail left. So I'm going to just work under the strands of yarn and I'm gonna go in a couple of different directions. So I don't like to go round and round. I like to go back and forth and up and down because I think that helps um, secure the ends a little bit better. If I just go round and round, then I can sort of pull those ends out. But if this end goes in a bunch of different directions, then it is not gonna come out. Then I can cut my yarn tail. I have another end to weave in down here. Again, look, I have probably six inches here to work with. I do wanna make sure that I close up any hole that I may have had at the beginning. I'm not super happy that I have a little hole there. So the first thing I'm gonna do is kind of pull those together so that I'm not unhappy. I check, make sure I like the way that looks on the right side. And then again, I'm not going to just work under the yarn like that because that can pop out. If there's, as this stretches, if you watch, let me see if I can do this. Watch this yarn, if you can see it, when I stretch this, can you see it move? Well, if I cut that yarn tail really short, it's gonna pop out between the stitches. So that's why I like to leave this nice long tail because now I've worked under those stitches, but now I can go up and maybe work 
in a different direction. I'm still staying under the red because I have plenty of red to work under. Now I'm kind of working diagonally or whatever. And this again is not going to come out. You aren't going to find yourself having to reweave in ends if you take the time in the beginning. So here we go. I think I have woven in these ends already because I didn't think about that till later. And there is my hat without a pom-pom yet. And I think pom-poms is a different class, but I will say this about pom-poms. Pom-poms need to be generous. Let me grab one here that has. So whenever you're making a pom-pom, you want to I, I like using a pom-pom maker. I find that the actual little plastic pom-pom makers are better at pom-poms than just wrapping it around a piece of cardboard, which I have also done um, plenty of times, but I, I really like the plastic pom-pom makers. But you want to make it generous. Use as much yarn as you can, um, because if it's a wimpy pom-pom, like nothing looks worse than a wimpy pom-pom. And maybe we can do pom-poms in another class sometime, but I just like a sad pom-pom is, it, a wimpy pom-pom is very sad, I think. Um, and this, this is a nice pom I I didn't make this pom-pom. I think mine would have had a few more wraps in it, but sometimes it has to do with how much energy you have or how many times you're willing to actually you know, do the wrap. And then look at how nicely this one was trimmed, right? This one is nice and round. So you also have to sort of be careful. Sometimes I'll think, oh, I've made this pom-pom, but I'm not going to trim it tonight because it's 10 o'clock at night and I might get a little happy with the scissors and go a little too far. So I wait till I, you know, have good light and feel like I can trim it. Um, nice and round because pom-poms don't start out looking like this straight from the pom-pom maker. You know, they're all <laughs> like they have long parts and short parts and stuff. But this one, I think somebody did a really good job with. I also love the way that this, um, this crystal yarn, what is it? Crystal cakes um, has these subtle color differences. Can you see that in this gray pom-pom? I don't know if that shows up on camera but you have the sparkly bits, but then you have these darker bits of gray. I think that's a really pretty, um, that makes a really beautiful pom-pom. And, and you can see the difference in colors on this um, shea butter colorway because it changed a little bit more. You see it's a little whiter here and a little gray and silver here. So I think it makes a really cool looking, elegant Santa hat or elf hat or, or whatever you want to call it. So what questions do we have now, Renee, about front loop only or picking up stitches or the decreases or finding the beginning of the round? What, what, what have I not covered well enough here? Um, it's pretty quiet aside from some pom-pom chatter. I think you were really thorough, but everyone, if you want to hop into the chat with questions, we can give that a few minutes. Um, Edie, what would the no maker pom-pom technique would be? That would be wrapping around cardboard? Yeah, so you can take a piece of cardboard. I don't actually have any cardboard, but um, well, let me actually here. I have a piece right here. I can, I can do it with this little piece of cardboard. How about that? Um, let me grab some yarn here. So what you would want to do is start with your hold your tie or whatever you're going to call it for your pom-pom. And then your piece of paper, your piece of cardboard, this one's not quite thick enough because it's going to bend, but you want it to be half the size or a little bit more than half the size of whatever your pom-pom is going to be. So this one would make a giant pom-pom. If you think of a pom-pom like this, that's going to be way too much. Um, but basically you're just gonna wrap it like this a bazillion times, right? That's a technical term, one bazillion times, very, very, very generously around here like this. So wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap and so on. And then cut it. Now, again, not wrapped nearly as much as it needs to be wrapped. 
And then you're going to tie these ends because this is what you're going to tie your pom pom on with. So you make that really, really tight and tie a square knot. And then you slide, you can cut, you cut the ends. Now I'm making more of a tassel here than a pom pom, but you're going to cut the ends. And if you had wrapped this a bazillion times, was it a bajillion or bazillion? I can't remember. It's going to be this giant ball of fuzz, right? It's just going to be a giant ball. And you see how that's not even even there? You're going to want to trim it like you give it a haircut or, or like trimming a, um, a bush, you know, like a um, topiary kind of thing. You're trying to make it nice and round. So that would be the no pom-pom maker way of doing it but you're gonna to have to wrap it many, many more times and you're gonna want a piece of cardboard. This is like, you know, you can see that's really bendy. You're gonna want a piece of corrugated cardboard in the size you wanna do it. And just out of curiosity, let's measure this pom-pom because this is a good size. That's another thing. Sometimes the size of the pom-pom is kind of hard to gauge. This one is about three inches across to give you an idea of how big that is. Now that's three inches in diameter, but each of the little fuzzy bits, if you go down into there, then is only half as much. So each of those is like, you know, maybe it's more like three and a quarter inches across. I can't quite see that. But if you think of that, that's not, each of these is not three inches, it's about half of that. Okay, but remember you want it a little bigger because you're going to have to trim it. If you look at this thing I did, see that this is already would have to be trimmed that much. My scissors, you want sharp scissors too, and my scissors aren't very sharp. So if you think about this, this would have turned into a pom-pom that's as big as my hand is right now. So that would have been a giant pom-pom. And Man, it would have eaten up the yarn too. If you're gonna make a giant pom-pom like this, you're gonna be using a lot of yarn, okay? <laughs> All right. Awesome, thank you for that uh, impromptu demo. We appreciate right. <laughs> it so much. <laughs> no, I didn't know we were doing pom-poms today, but. <laughs> I know, I, th I think that helped explain the theory a little bit, which is great. Right. All right, let's see. I see that somebody's saying, talking about hat measurements again. So how do you measure gauge? Um, so the gauge, we're talking about the gauge of the fabric, right? So the gauge of the fabric is how many stitches and rows or rounds you have in each, uh, well, per inch or over four inches. So you would want to know, you can measure it. I could measure it right here on this hat but you wanna know how many double crochets you have over four inches. When I was doing the hat, this is somebody else made this hat and this is the hat that I made. When I was starting this, I actually took the yarn and the hook and just did a double crochet swatch. So I just did a little piece of double crochet so that I could count and see if I was getting 12 double crochets in four inches, which I was pretty close. So that was, I knew I had the right size hook. Um, so you might just want to do a little piece of double crochet. Another thing you can, and that was back and forth. Another thing you can do, you could start the hat, but at some point you're going to want to stop and measure. Let me grab a ruler here that you can see. Hang on. You're going to stop and want to measure to see if you've gotten the right gauge. So I bought a new ruler so that you can see the ruler. How about that? So if I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. This one actually is a little, little off, but sometimes you measure it in a couple of different places. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So you want to make sure that you have 12 stitches per four inches. Okay. And it, whoever asked that question about the gauge, um, yes, it is this section right here because this is the double crochet section. This single crochet section, the brim was not, there was no gauge given for that. This is the part that really matters. 
Yep. Okay. Um, let's see. Awesome. Um, I feel like there was one more. Hang on. Um, a brilliant comment of you can use a fork to make a pom pom. I would you can make little teeny, yes, I've made little cute little pom-poms. I love to make pom-poms. So Renee, when y'all are talking about pom-poms, I got all kinds of pom-pom ideas, but that's- <laughs> I think we might need a pom-pom class. class. Just, just have me do the pom-pom class, okay? Because I want to make pom-poms. Absolutely noted. All right. Amazing. Um, I feel like there's one more, just give me a sec. Um, could this also be considered a slouchy hat from Patty? Sure. I mean, if, if you can call it anything you want to, right? So if you want to do it in, you know, leave off the pom-pom or if you want to um, do it in different colors or without the bling, I'm not really a, a sparkly person. So I think, you know, my next hat's probably not going to have the sparkles on it. But um, yeah, you can do it any way you like. I Like I say, you can even make, if you put four rounds between or three or four rounds between each decrease round, it's going to be a lot longer. So if you think about, you know, like the elves with their really long uh, hats, you know, I, I don't know, I can't draw one, but you know what I'm talking about where they're <laughs> long um, and sort of hang down their back or whatever. You could do the same thing with this hat. You just do more work even rounds in between the decrease rounds. So that's another, that's another idea you could do. And with this yarn, you have plenty of yarn to play with because you're gonna be able to get a lot of hats out of these two balls of yarn. Absolutely, lots, okay. lots of yarn to practice with. Yeah. The whole family can have Santa hats. <laughs> um, okay, so Mary Lenora, when making the brim, how many single crochets do you do in order to go to the next row? The red part had three single crochet loops. So do you do two? two single crochet loops to get to the next row. Um, let me pull up the pattern here for you, Mary. Um, the red part has, okay. So it's not three, three single crochet. I think it's because Mary's new and maybe, um, so this is called double crochet and this was single crochet in the back loop only. Oh, chains. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Thanks, so, thank you very much. So what we're doing when we're talking about those chains, when you're doing single crochets, um, if you think about the height of a single crochet stitch, it's not as tall as a double crochet stitch, right? So when you're working double crochet, let me back up and come over here. When you're working double crochet, you have to get the hook up to the top of the next round before you can do the crochet because all the stitches are made below the hook. So I'm going to use one, two, three chains. And now I'll be building my double crochet below my hook. But you see how high my hook is? And I'm building the stitch underneath my hook. And then, I, then I'm back up here again. But with single crochet, it only takes one chain, one chain, and then you go in, pull up a loop and yarn over and pull through two because it's so much shorter. So the turning chain for single crochet is one, the turning chain or the build up chain for double crochet is three because the double crochet is taller. And in this event, we're not counting the chain one as a stitch, but we are counting the chain three as a stitch. And those are some really basic, um, if, if you're new, those are the things that are probably the hardest things to understand. But once you have an understanding of turning chains, um, that will make your life a lot easier. So I'm glad you asked that. And um, I actually have a blog post about where to put, the, like about turning chains and where to put the first row of a stitch. Um, so that might help you too. And um, maybe I know Renee's good at finding links, but that's, that's a, um, might be another thing that would be helpful for you to learn. Okay. Um, where to measure your head. Ash, do you mind switching camera, please? 
I just measure like where, where you're going to wear your hat, right? So usually middle of the forehead right here. Um, I can't see you. You can tell me how big around my head is. I can't actually see that, but because um, I can't, I don't know where the beginning of the thing is. But I think that says it's like 22 and a quarter inches. So just anywhere about around here, where, where the bottom of the hat is gonna end up. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Um, you just confirming the blog post is called where to put the first stitch of a crochet row. Is that the yeah. one? Mm -hmm. Perfect. So I'm gonna drop that in the chat for everyone. Thank you. Awesome. Cool, well, I think that's everything. Okay, well, I hope everybody has a happy holiday season. I'll be here again in December doing coasters. We're gonna do, be doing star coasters sometime. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another little holiday, everybody seasonal, everybody can use a star, so that'll be fun. And I hope you make lots of Santa hats. And if you do, I would love to see them. Share, and I'm gonna get this right, share using hashtag Yarnspo. Did I get that right? Yeah, you got that. Okay, share using Yarnspo. And if you wanna tag me too, I'm at Edie Ekman everywhere, Facebook, Instagram everywhere. And you can find me at edieekman.com. Perfect. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. We were so happy to have you with us. Um, as Edie said, don't forget to tar uh, tag with Yarnspo. That's Y-A-R-N-S-P-O. And then also hashtag make it with Michaels because we really want to see what you come up with. And uh, Ash has mentioned this a few times in the chat as well, but you can find more classes on michaels.com and a recording of today's class at michaels.com slash classes. All right, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.